Greetings, everyone. I'm Patricia Terrell, the Meetings and Program Coordinator for the American Physiological Society and the moderator for today's webinar. Thank you for taking the time to attend this very unique and exciting webinar titled Integrating LT-Based Inquiry into an Existing Anatomy and Physiology Lab Sequence. Before we begin, here are a few important housekeeping notes. The webinar will be recorded and made available for on-demand viewing following the event. To maintain scientific integrity and respect for our presenters, please refrain from taking photos or videos of this presentation in whole or in part. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, you will find the Q&A and chat features. To ensure prompt receipt of your question, we ask that you submit your questions and comments via the Q&A feature and not the chat. You may do so at any time during the presentation. The Q&A session will begin shortly after the presentation. In addition, live captions are also available by clicking the live transcript icon also at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Today's speaker is Dr. Lance Irvin. Without further delay, I would like to talk about his bio and let you know who this awesome professor is. He is the professor of biology at Marion University in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. His doctoral training was at the University of California, Davis, and postdoctoral study at the Johns Hopkins University and the then Southwest Foundation for My Biomedical Research. He has taught undergraduate anatomy and physiology, histology, cell biology, and developmental biology, among other subjects, for 32 years. He was the recipient of many awards for the College of Letters and Sciences Teacher of the Year at Wisconsin Whitewater and the Undercoffler Teacher of the Year at Marion University. It is with great pleasure that I present to you Dr. Lance Irvin. Dr. Lance, you may join us. Okay, Dr. Lance, you may. Yeah, may. Sorry. That's okay. I can see your slides and I can hear you audibly. Have a great presentation. Thank you very much, Patricia. And uh, thank you very much, Jacob and Margaret behind the scenes, and especially uh, American Physiological Society for the invitation. Um, I'm pleased to be here. Um, and um, I am an educator. Um, that's that's my passion. And I'm here not to tell you about any great breakthrough in theories of learning. And I'm not a physiological research, physiology researcher. So I'm not here to talk about that. What I'm here to talk about is how to teach well. And, and really not, nothing that you haven't seen, but to encourage you to use the tools that you have. Um, many times we feel that uh, for continuity's purpose, for ease's purpose, for ease purposes, um, for whatever reason, that we need to adopt a single source of teaching material and um, stick with it. And, and that's not the case at all. What we want to do is build courses, build instruction, and achieve goals for our students or have our students achieve goals that will help them meet their needs and meet their wishes, their needs. Um, and, and we do that best by finding what works um, in our circumstances. And so what I want to do is encourage you, though the take-home lesson up front is um, find resources that work best for you. Don't be afraid to use them, mix them up, and uh, take an a la carte approach to teaching. Um, and in this particular instance, um, we're using a particular tool from AD Instruments called LT to introduce physiology into what was um, what we thought was a, a, a pretty good anatomy instructional course and melding the two by mixing um, them uh, with careful thought as to sequence and content uh, to make what we feel is, is, a, um, is an efficient and um, valuable course for our students. So when, whenever you start a course, you want to start with, well, the big picture. 
um, the big picture of where your course is in the curriculum, where your course is um, in the progress of your students, and what you hope the students carry out of it. Um, and my course, the particular course that I'm talking about, is designed, was it designed specifically for uh, the pre-nursing students. The students are preparing for applying to and starting their clinical training. So it's their basic sciences, anatomy and physiology. It's a two semester sequence. Um, and it has a separate lab uh, that we've actually added on uh, for the benefit of the pre-health professionals, those who are applying to physical therapy and physician assistant and so forth after school uh, that want the lab. Nurses didn't care for the lab. They had plenty of clinical training in the lab work coming. Um, so that's our course. It's, it's uh, for most of the nursing students take it as second semester freshman, first semester sophomore, and uh, then take the second semester and uh, go from there. But the lab course has become, the lab portion, it's a separate course, has become increasingly important as we have more of the pre-health professional students joining us. We have more majors that want this as they prepare for um, graduate school or going into careers. The, the lab has become more important and we've sought to integrate the laboratory and the lecture together. So to start, how, what did we want, what do we want them to learn? And for me, this is the goal that I have for every course, whether it's introductory general biology, biology for gen ed, for humanity students, whether it's a capstone course in science. Uh, my main goal is always this, that I want students to understand what science is. Uh, this is important for us as scientists, and it's important for the average citizen. You can just look at the media today to see how poorly the general public understands science, and I feel guilty about that. So I keep that at the front. So I want my students to learn what are the assumptions of science? What, what do we believe is fundamentally true about the world that we ex take advantage of to, to do science? Uh, what do we hope to do with science, both practically and um, um, in the bigger picture as, 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 as just as understanding for the aesthetics and, and the, the knowledge and what are our constraints? What is it that we cannot approach? Uh, and that's, that's a fundamental thing. If I can get our students to understand that, uh, I think um, they'll be much better citizens. However, you know, that, that's pretty broad and, and that's not going to be clear. It's going to be hard to assess. So what we do then is, is we try to approach that by the more accessible scientific, what we call a scientific method, uh, whether stereotypical or in the way it's really applied. So I want them to really believe that they want to be careful observers. And I want them to understand that experimentation is a way to expand those observations and understand what they've seen. And then with the experimentation, probably the crux of all of it is to be good reasoners. What is What do those observations suggest to us how do we test that idea? How do we um, see if if we can support that? Um, so that's that's what I'm hoping that we get. Now, if you're telling a freshman or sophomore student who is planning to be a nurse that this is what they're going to get out of the, the course, um, they're unlikely to embrace that wholeheartedly. Um, it's always been true, I think, and even more today that um, our students are pretty pragmatic, at least my students are. They're very career oriented. Um, they're making a big investment. When I was an undergrad, it was reasonably affordable back in the dark ages. Um, it's not so anymore. So our students are very career oriented. Uh, how are they gonna pay for their education and is it gonna be worth it? So that's where I start. I, I, I appeal to them uh, pragmatically and then hope to move them in the direction of the greater, um, good that I see under and in, internalized in my bullet points. So what appeals more to them than can they actually meet their career? Can they actually get their job? And for my group, they're pretty motivated by the fact that in another semester or two, they're going to be taking their admissions exams to apply for nursing school, uh, apply for um, clinical training in, in rad tech. Um, in it, for the pre-meds and, and the pre-health professions in two years, they'll be taking those exams. And physiology and anatomy is likely to be a part of those, and it's going to be essential to their success. So that's pretty motivating, and that's where I start them. 
and then slide them where I want them to go otherwise. Um, then uh, only a, a slightly harder sell is not only do you have to pass those exams, but you have to pass those exams with useful knowledge. Um, most of them are going to be some kind of clinician. Uh, those that aren't are planning some kind of career in science. And so to do that, they need much of the information that we're sharing in our courses. And again, they need to be able to solve the problems. They need to be able to answer the questions that don't come in multiple choice form. We want them to be able to, rather than pick a diagnosis and a treatment plan off of five choices, we need them to look at the, the whole patient, all of the data, all of the tests, and all the limitations the patient might have because of other medical conditions and come up with a treatment plan. And uh, that is a harder sell, but as they mature, they get more and more interested in, in that and recognize that importance. So that, that is also very, very helpful in moving us along our agenda. That's, um, that's actually me some years ago when my son, son was um, in junior high taking uh, uh, online learning and he would sit in my class, and that's how what he was doing instead of his classwork. Uh, but it's a pretty accurate representation because that's how I start classes. Even though I have these greater goals, I recognize where the students start. They're coming out of high school, and they have been, high school's under a lot of pressure to be able to pass standardized exams. Um, I really respect our high school teachers, um, but they're under a lot of limitations. And they are driven to be able to make sure those students can pass those multiple choice questions. And exploratory learning, um, scientific experimentation doesn't lend quite so well to getting 90% on that exam as just training them and giving them the, the sage on the stage model. And so that's what they're used to by and large. Um, and so that's where I start them. That's what they expect. And so that's what I give them to begin. So we start out with what I call factoids. We, we believe these things to be true. You and I, understanding science, recognize that those are more or less tentative. But we, we start, I start out, here's some information. And that also gives us the opportunity to have something to work with. You can't reason about nothing. You have to have information to start with. You have to have assumptions or data to think about. So we give them some place to start. So I'm talking about things like the stages of mitosis, the uh, um, uh, the names of the bones, uh, the, the markings on the bones, um, what we believe about how the cross bridge cycle works in muscles, those kinds of things. But as we move to things that are more conceptual, like the cross bridge cycle in muscles, as an example, I start to transition them from here's what we know, here's what you need to know, to well, here's why we think this is true. Um, can start with descriptions of why we think that true of the experiments, the seminal experiments, or hopefully more current experiments that lead us to what we're teaching as factoids. Uh, even better, if you can do demos, and I'm thinking now about the lecture part of the class more than the lab, we'll work towards the lab in, in a few minutes. Um, if you can demo um, observations and, and experiments in class, that's even better, because this is a video generation, and they want to see action. Um, if they're not looking at you, they're probably looking at TikTok. So give them something to look at besides TikTok and do experiments when you can, when you can work it in. Now, this is a, a big ask because it can only, uh, you know, can only do so much in a lecture setting. And the larger the class, the more challenging it is. But work it in as you can and explain how these demonstrations, these experiments support the ideas that we're supporting or that we're um, giving to them or perhaps don't support those ideas and lead us to uh, perhaps an alternative hypothesis. And then for success, I, th I, I feel I've seen success if we get to this level. If they at least accept this idea that they, um, that they can make hypotheses and they can make predictions from those hypotheses um, and, and theories as well. And then what can they do with those? Can they actually design experiments to test those hypotheses? Can they analyze the data from those experiments? And do they know what that data means? Can they draw conclusion? conclusions? Does it support? Does it not support the hypothesis? Does it suggest another hypothesis? That's, that's a success. 
uh, in, in every way for a science student, um, regardless of their career goals. So that's, that's, that's what I'm working for. That's how I design my courses to approach. Okay, how do we do that? Um, what are the opportunities available to us to make that happen? Um, collaboration is a big thing. Now, for me, that's become pretty easy because as we've re we're approaching the enrollment cliff and cliff, and uh, as you know, the baby boomers and baby boomers' children are are aging out. We have smaller class sizes and um, a lack of enthusiasm about returning to a four-year college after COVID. Um, we've been downsizing, so I've become an anatomy and physiology department of one. But even before, when I had colleagues that were alternating with me in lecture, alternating with me in lab. Um, I was fortunate enough to have faculty who were very dedicated and willing to work for the common good and collaborate. And the most important thing to that regard is to coordinate the lecture and lab so that they're a functional whole. Um, even when they're one course, the lab enrollment is part of enrolling in lecture. This isn't always an easy thing. It's, it's, it's um, tempting to kind of set up a schedule and follow it regardless of what's happening over your shoulder in the other half of the course. Um, but that's really to our disadvantage and to the student's disadvantage. What we wanna do is, is coordinate them so that each is supporting the other. Um, we want to either prepare the students for what's gonna happen in the other part of the course or uh, reinforce what's in that other course that we feel that perhaps they could use better support than we can give in one format or the other. Um, and along the way, so what, so we'll we'll sit down and we will compare our syllabi. I, I would think I would like to cover this topic first because it allows us to go on to this topic. For instance, I have over the years tried flipping, I usually go the traditional order that you find in the textbooks. Um, so it'd be muscle and then nerve. And that's always bothered me because we did such a better job talking about action potential with nerve than muscle but you can't actually talk about muscle physiology without action potential. So I've tried it both ways. And when I do, I coordinate that with what we're doing in lab to get the same order. Uh, and then, um, then we talk, we, we meet regularly. Um, how are they doing in, in lecture? When you covered action, action potential, uh, how'd they do? Did they have a particular part that they were not understanding? Uh, where, how can I help? by supplementing in lab. Um, so that too will, will make the course go better and make help the students meet their goals. Um, now, we are teaching in, in two different ways, typically. I think most of us do have a lab class and a lecture class that are um, both taught. And, and you wanna take advantage of those different learning modalities. Um, lecture and discussion, I, I, I typically schedule labs so they follow or are concurrent with what's going on in lecture, preferably following just a little bit. Um, if they're getting that basic startup information, muscle structure, um, that reduces time you have to use in lab for the didactics, for explaining that again, the, the, the rote material, if you will. Um, I don't think that's what lab is for. Lab is an opportunity to get them, get their hands dirty and they're already getting talked to in lecture. So if I know what's happened in lecture, then, and I know that they're succeeding with that, they're, they're doing well with that, I just take that right out of the lab and go straight to the next part. Or at minimum, I'll just say, remember when, and this is what you did, and, and leave it at that. So use lecture to your advantage so that you can use lab for what it does best. And that's here. Um, lab, even the best lecturer, um, can only do so much and, and push so many buttons. It's pretty well accepted that learning is best when it's multimodality. In lecture, you can, well, certainly here, um, they can see illustrations and um, pictures and words, uh, but they're not handling anything. They're not touching anything. They're not holding anything. They're not turning it over. And even the best computer animations can only do so much in substituting for that. Um, they're not actively involved, generally, uh, at least in a pure lecture. And, and all of that can reinforce what they're hearing and seeing. Um, 
as far as instructions. In, in my case, even smell triggers triggers memories. Uh, gross anatomy, all these years later, is still very vivid, and it's even more vivid when I open up that cadaver lab and I smell that smell again. And there are certain experiences, certain things I saw uh, and I learned in anatomy lab that come back first. Uh, so even smell can be reinforcing for a learning. So take advantage of that uh, and, and use the relationship with lecture to maximize those experiences and minimize the I'm talking to you experiences. So the way we do it, and I've hinted at this already, start out with a didactic presentation, start out with the factoids, start out with what they expect to hear and what they need to know to be able to enter and use a lab um, appropriately. Um, I am a PowerPoint dr driven instructor just as, as I'm working here, um, but that's not enough either. Um, I take great, great pride in my PowerPoints uh, in class, crafting them so I have the right length of bullet points and, and good illustrations and such, but none of that compares to a really good analogy. Um, I will use my hands. I will demonstrate, for instance, um, gap junctions and gap junctions and how they combine between cells to form a continuous, um, a continuous channel between cells. Um, anything that's visual, anything that they can see acting is a, is a good supplement in lecture. Again, if you can do demos, if your class size is amenable, uh, your model sizes are large enough, um, use them when you can because they appreciate more than just being talked to. Um, if you have the good fortune of having a discussion section attached to that, use it. Um, I don't, but I will carve out a few minutes at a time in my lecture to have discussion. Um, I find that if you give students an opportunity to use the knowledge as they're collecting it, they will remember it better. Um, I will start them again with kind of the, the high school model of here's what you saw in the last four slides. Um, here's a structure for a table. Put your information in there. Organize your information so it's, it's a study guide for you. And then as, as they get used to working in, in small groups, I, I encourage two or three typically. Uh, we'll accept four yeah, and, and when they're comfortable with that. Um, then we'll have them solve problems. Uh, given the electrical signaling in the heart, if this drug is given or if a patient presents this way, um, what's the probable cause? What's the solution? Work them towards that. That's not something they will appreciate first days, but as they become comfortable with you, comfortable with each other, they, they it will grow on them. And it also gives the students an opportunity to interact. Um, if you can get the stronger students with students who have to work a bit harder, that's an advantage to both. The students who um, are challenged more, um, they see me as an intimidating figure. My sons don't see that at all, but my, my students are a little reluctant to come see me. And I've never understood, but that's what I'm told. Um, but they are not at all uh, reluctant to ask the kid across the table, the student across the table, how did that work? What did he mean? Is he out of his mind? Uh, kinds of questions. And they will accept the answer. And the person providing the answers, as we know, as teachers, um, it becomes reinforced in their mind. I, I've, I learned histology better when I taught it than when I, than when I took it. And um, it forms working really, uh, working as, um, relationships between them. And it's in a setting where I can kind of troll and eavesdrop. And if they're getting off track or perhaps misunderstood, I can gently intervene to get them back on course. Okay, so that's that was in place even before we went to the lab. Now the lab. Um, I encourage you to find a theme that will join every exercise, every lesson together. And, and we're offered some pretty straightforward ones in anatomy and physiology. Uh, one is homeostasis, which I use extensively in lecture. Everything is homeostasis in lecture. Uh, and I in integrate it as I can into lab. Lab, though, is driven by, more by this other one, that relationship between function and structure. Function dictates structure, and structure reveals function. Uh, generally, in lab, I prefer structure first. Here's what it looks like, here's how it works, and then they can see how the parts move. It's hard to imagine, for instance, how a car, to explain how a car works if they've never seen the pieces. 
So show them the pieces, let them learn the pieces, and then, then do function. That's not to say it can't work the other way, because it can't, because function dictates structure. But that's that's worked for us for, for a long time. Um, I don't do anything innovative as far as, as order. I will go through much as most textbooks do, um, organ system by organ system. Uh, I don't do integument in lab much. I, I find there's little that I know of, perhaps you're different, but that I know of that's can add substantively to what they get in lecture, the pictures and, and such you see in the lectures. Microscope slides are almost pictures, and there's not a lot of experimental kind of work that I think is of particular value to, to justify that time. So I skip usually right to muscles and lab, but then I go in order. So that's I guess that's part of my first lesson. My main lesson is feel free to adapt. If you don't see particular value, if it doesn't work for your particular course's needs, your particular students, skip it or substitute it. Um, just because it's the first chapter in the lab manual doesn't mean you have to do it or use all of it. So structure first. Um, and here's where I'm saying to integrate. We are very happy with our, our lab instruction for anatomy. Uh, my mentor, when I came to Marion University, was an incredible anatomist. And she had put together a good course. Um, I, I'm a histologist more than an anatomist. So um, she allowed me to work in some of the histology that we thought would be helpful. And together, we were pretty happy with the course we crafted. We team taught it for, for some time. Um, but it, it's, it's mostly traditional. Um, and we can use most lab manuals to make it work. Um, so we have models in our, our lab that we've been using for a long time. Uh, we have a good slide collection. Uh, and we have a regular budget that the chair is expecting every year for specimens and for dissections. So for the lab, when we brought in, integrated the, the physiology and the anatomy, we didn't do much different at all in the anatomy side. Uh, no new expense. We use what we have available. That's part two. Uh, use what you have to best advantage. You don't have to get something different to fit. If you change lab manuals, you don't have to go out and buy all new models. Use a la carte approach. Use those portions of the lab manual that have worked well for you in the past, and those that haven't, modify them or substitute them. But for the anatomy side, um, that was essentially free because we had a system that worked, and we weren't going to vary from it as we worked in stuff from outside, from other sources. Function comes next, and this is the way I organize the labs. First, what's happening in lecture, and can I follow that right on the heels uh, of what's going on in lecture? Here's the structure. And then the next meeting is, is physiology for that same anatomy, for that same system. So it's fresh in their mind. What did we just see? Here's how we use it. First lab um, is going to be normal function, uh, regular ex expected data collection. Uh, no surprises. They know what the ECG looks like from lecture. Let's see if they can find that. For themselves and uh, they're, they're, they're learning the system how does it work how do i collect data how do i interpret that data i collect then and not all units will be amenable to this but when they are that's when you move to that mastery step work them towards that mastery um, if they learn how to use their physiograph use the physiograph um, they've learned how to collect the data they've learned where to place the sensors what's a new question how can you change your independent variable to make it work. So you can actually move on to that experimentation and scientific reasoning and even hypothesis building for many things. Uh, EMG is one that works well for it. ECG is another. Um, so you can break them in easily by offering them a new question that they generate a hypothesis for or let them hit the ground running. Come up with a question that you can address the system with or you can address with this system um, and then let them go. Let them design the experiments. Of course, you want to kind of watch over their shoulders to make sure they're going in the direction that's going to be fruitful, but but let them have autonomy and, and build their chops as far as asking questions, devising hypothesis, answering with hypotheses, and devising experiments and collecting data and analyzing that. So the time came. Um, I was not at all happy with most of the physiology exercises that are done on the cheap in most commercial lab manuals. So we cast about for other systems. 
And we set the lab manual that we use for structure for anatomy aside. And we went looking for something that would work in our lab. And I would suggest for many of you, these same criteria may be helpful. Um, we were looking for something that's simple to learn and use. I'm a full-time teacher. Um, we're carrying overload now, again, because of the enrollment crunch. Um, many of you, if not full-time teachers, have plenty on your plate otherwise, in the lab or administrative duties or whatever. We're all busy. So I don't want to spend hours and days learning to use a new system, and certainly the students do. They have plenty of, of um, on their plate as well. Um, in my school, um, we are a private school, so we don't have state subsidies. Uh, we are uh, enrollment driven or tuition driven. Um, our students are, many of our students are first generation. Uh, many of our students are middle class or less. Um, and so they don't, if they're not in class, they're working to pay for their education or to support their families. Many of them have families today. Uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned um, an enrollment strategy at my school is athletics. We have other than football, almost every sport you can imagine and continuing to find more to add to recruit students. Um, that's, that's, that drives enrollment for us. And so on top of paying for their education, supporting their families, they've got practice and games, and now we're asking them to learn on top of that. So let's use that time efficiently. Let's not ask them to spend too much time how to use that equipment and get right to what can that equipment tell us. So it has to be simple to learn and use both for their sake and ours. Um, a component of that is minimal instrumentation. The less instruments you use, the less can go broke. I, I am of a philosophy, when I buy a car, I want manual windows if I can find it. I want a manual transmission. Um, I want it as simple as possible so that there's less to break. And that's true here too. If it does break, there's only one thing to replace. So I look for a modular system where it's not all built in one. So if one thing goes bad, you have to replace the whole thing. So modular and minimal instrumentation. Get only the equipment that you need. Um, avoid buying kits unless there's a real savings there. Uh, buy them a piece at a time for the particular exercises that will fit your curriculum, your goals, what is important in your class. So for instance, if you're teaching exercise in sports science, um, sp um, biomechanics and uh, exercise of physiology, you're really going to be emphasizing skeletal muscular and nervous. Uh, you may not have much need for, say, um, endocrine. You may not have much need for, say, um, digestive for that particular population, for their particular goals. So don't buy them. Get, and if you get a modular set, that helps. Uh, inexpensive for physiographs, that's, that's a, a big ask. Um, but you're looking for if not inexpensive, at least the best value. And, and that's what we, we, were, we, we felt we found. Um, and then, and most important for the, the theme of this discussion, is we want it to be um, customizable. We want, we want something that can use right out of the box, so we can go use it right away as we learn the system, learn how it works. But then after the first time through, the second time through, the third, forever, really, every time you go through it, you say, you know, um, we covered that well in lecture. We really don't need to do that in, la in lab again. Let's take that out. Or we need to supplement that part that's not covered as well here uh, because our students struggled with that in lecture and in, in the lab before. Um, so we want something we can start with, but then as we recognize the students' needs and the changing needs of a curriculum, we can change, we can customize it. We can alter it to fit what's going on. So I'm saying not only find different sources, open educational resource, purchase manuals, whatever it might be, um, but not only be willing to, to go back and forth between those that work, but I'm saying even within units, be willing to check your successes, check your failures, if and there's going to be. Um, and and continue to adjust on the fly. And so we were looking for a physiograph system that would uh, allow us to do that. Uh, what we, we landed on this time was the LT sensors from AD Instruments. Um, we've tried them once and it was, if we're pretty happy with the results so far. Um, the sensors are modular. 
They um, don't have a central box that everything has to plug into that can break and is very expensive. Uh, they plug right into a laptop. Um, it's hard to find students uh, who don't have laptops. And when we do, if there are students who don't have laptops available, we have loaners on hand. And so the sensors all have USB plugs. You put them, plug them right into the computer's port. Um, and then uh, we bought those sensors because they are a bit pricey. Um, and then the students subscribe to the software. And the software includes the pre-lab instruction, the actual um, collecting of data, and the post-lab work on analyzing the data and interpreting it. Um, and it's, it's all web-based. So the, um, the company will make adjustments to that, uh, corrections to that, fix it, make it more usable. We don't have to worry about the programming. We don't have to worry about whether that's working in our computer. All we have to do is connect to the web. Um, it's also a subscription service. And you can subscribe um, chapter by chapter, unit by unit, and pick the units you like. And the students only pay for those units. And they are, I believe, on a month-by-month -month basis, if you so choose. So in my course, uh, as we'll see in the next slide or two, um, we teach a and Lab 1 twice a week for half a semester, and a and Lab 2 the second half of the semester twice a week. So we'll be in and out of a, a lab unit in a week or two weeks. So if they only have to buy it for a portion of the semester, the portion they're using it, saving them money, um, and, and it's very uh, effective. Um, we also liked it because it was uh, actually more than we need as far as pre-lab. It was pretty thorough as far as the underlying anatomy and theory uh, behind the lab that was coming. And because it's it can be modified because you can edit it, we can add or subtract as we like, but it's there to begin with. It's easier to take out something that's excessive than add something that's missing. It also includes um, regular, routine, frequent student assessment, both in the pre-lab material, um, the post-lab material, and even while collecting the data, they will occasionally throw in uh, questions to check the understanding. And those, those questions, they can either be strictly for the student's self-learning, or you can be um, for grading too. You can choose whether points are assigned or not, and whether you graded or not. Uh, and then the um, actual data collection was pretty um, easy to use and uh, convenient. You don't have to have a separate lab manual. It's all built in. Uh, I, I don't know if you can see on the slide or on the picture uh, of this laptop. Here's some of the sensors that we use. This uh, finger transducer, um, uh, a force transducer uh, for um, palm strength. Um, uh, ECG leads here, I think. Uh, but here's the data collection window. Here's the data that's being recorded. And here's a scroll down window that would tell the students step by step what to do as they go through and learn it. So generally, the first lab was cookbook. Follow these steps, collect this data, and, and we'll help you understand what it means. Then often you can have them propose their own questions, use some of the many of those same steps, but collect data in response to different challenges, different independent variables. And there are some labs that I find are just, that would be nice to do, it'd be, be very instructive, the students would learn a lot, but they're just impractical. Uh, endocrinology is, is my personal um, best in that category. Uh, endocrinology labs are amazing. There's so much a student can learn from doing an endocrine lab. But we have no animal facility. We have no animal care and use committee. Um, and even if we, even when we did, even when I was at a, a, another university where we had those things, uh, endocrinology lab usually means weeks of prep and uh, administration and data collection, and that's just not practical for an undergraduate introductory A and P lab. So there are uh, simulation labs available where they will show you what experiment could be done, what that those results might look like, and then allow them to do the data analysis. So that's an option here too with this system that you can, again, subscribe to on a module, use it if you want it. If you don't want it, don't need it. Students don't have to pay for it. Um, so as, as I suggested, our labs are 
for a two semester lecture course, there's two semester labs. Um, the example I have up here is from the second lab course, Anatomy and Phys 2. One credit, meet twice a week, and we go for just half a semester. And for the structure labs, I went to open resource. Uh, I actually use a different open resource for Anatomy and Phys 1 and Anatomy and Phys 2. This is Anatomy and Phys 2. It came from um, University System of Georgia. Uh, that one, I think we downloaded as PDF. And it was very traditional, very typical heart dissection, for example. And so we got them their structure first. Next meeting, structure unit from OER lab is what we use, but you can use any lab manual or your own materials. If you write you author your own, that's great too. Then the next meeting, whether it's the next uh, class that week or the next week, we'd go to the physiograph. Um, and again, you can pick modules to fit together for pre-lab and the actual lab exercises. Uh, this is an example of the one we used, um, ECG basics on the way to an ECG and exercise lab. This is pre-lab. Um, this is the material um, that they would use on lab day when they're being introduced to the equipment. These are instructions on how to actually put the ECG leads on and then start to how to collect the data. And then we had um, post lab analysis and um, post lab assessment. Uh, this lab, because they're, they're web based, you can also do pre lab and post lab outside of class time. And certainly pre lab, I did that. Post lab, I did, depending on how much time we had available to us. Uh, in order to do the lab, you had to answer these questions in your pre-lab before you came in, and they can access that from their own computer, from the library computer, wherever. Uh, so that also can make your lab time more accessible. Uh, and so we're pretty happy with, with how it turned out. We took a tried and true set of labs that we could pick whatever lab manual fit best, and that we would either customize or well, we would customize to fit the models we have on hand, the budget we have for, to set, for specimens and dissection, and uh, just our lab space. And then we brought in a separate, completely independent uh, physiograph system uh, and made it, merged it a week at a time, either even a day at a time into the lab so that they complemented each other. So our goals was to, were to coordinate the lecture in the lab and to maximize our course goals that the students would learn anatomical structure, they would understand physiological concepts, and then they would understand why do we hold those physiological concepts? Why do we believe them to be true? And to be able to practice those skills that allow us to understand the world around us, including physiology. Um, we did that by making sure we coordinated our lectures in our labs. And we centralized this particular theme of structure and function, um, certainly in lab and in large part in lecture two. I would talk about, I would, in lecture, we would give them an overview of function, then go into detail and structure, and then go back and show how function derived from that structure. So we used the same general theming and um, organization in both lecture and lab. Um, then we took what we already have that we're pleased with, our anatomy labs, and integrated them and alternated them with a physiology set. And we use this particular one. There are others on the market that you can consider, but we're pretty happy with this one. Um, and it's really helpful if you can buy one that's packaged to use off the shelf, but then you can fix it, adjust, not fix it, but adjust it to your needs and your facilities and your students' goals as you go along. Um, result we were looking for and feel that we mostly got. Uh, is, is the students would learn their organ system structure first. Then when they learned the physiology with their own data, that would reinforce the structure we talked about before. Why did that happen? Well, because it's built this way. And then finally, um, the approach in lab was to let them practice with the cookbook, expected kinds of answers, data collection, and then where the particular topic was amenable, allow them to go on to generate their own questions, their own hypotheses, and do their own tests. Examples in my class, I've already mentioned how uh, many of our students are student athletes. Um, they like questions like, 
how do energy drinks uh, affect performance of exercise? How does that reflect in an ECG or respiration? Those kinds of things. They like exercise, but there's lots of possibilities depending on the group and let them explore that as much as you can. And that's where you just take your hands off the reins. You've trained them to do, do these things, let them go and just keep guiding them so that uh, they don't get off the path. So I, I hope this has been useful to you, that you, again, the main thing I'm trying to drive home is don't be married to an existing system. Put together a system that meets your needs and meets your students' needs. And, bring, and seek them out from different places and just fit them um, so they complement each other. Um, and, at this, and with that, you know, I'd be happy to stop and, and take questions. Dr. Irvin, thank you so much for your presentation. I really like the uh, artwork that you shared, that your son shared with you, a uh, very creative depiction of how you looked when you had longer hair, right? I did. I, I, I always wait five years to make sure fashion is going to set. So it was <laughs> five years after mullets were popular. Yes, that was very nice. And it's, it really is interesting how professors today have many more competing distractions than, of course, we had when I was in college. So... Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And before we get into the Q&A, we have one uh, poll that we want to launch on behalf of ADI Instruments. And so you see the poll, please take a moment to uh, respond and then we'll get started with the chat um, Q&A. Okay, looks like we're there. All right. Okay, we have that taken care of. Now let's go ahead and move into the Q&A portion. We have quite a few questions. So I'm going to start with Donald Shaw. Dr. Irvin, what did you mean multi-modality in lecture is the best? And this is a two-part question. Can you give an example on this idea? And this is from Donald Shaw. Okay, so multimodal, what I mean by that is don't just, just talk to them. I mean, engage as many of their senses as they can because they are mutually reinforcing. Um, so for instance, um, when we talk about, in lecture, when we talk about um, plural pressure and uh, the breathing cycle, respiratory cycle. Um, you typically see in textbooks, you'll see um, uh, a, a bag and someone will stick a fist into the bag uh, to represent the lungs in the pleural cavity surrounded by the pleural membranes. Uh, I'll do that. I will go, uh, I'll go grab the garbage can. Um, hopefully when it's not been used, I have a lot of morning classes. I'll pull out the plastic bag. I will fill it with air, tie it off, and I'll stick my fist in it. So they're seeing it, they're hearing it um, as we talk about it. So they're, they're seeing, hearing, um, it's three-dimensional. Um, so that's what I mean by different senses at a time. Um, if the class is small enough, uh, when we do skeletal anatomy, I'll throw bone models at each table and, and let them handle them, touch them, um, as well as we're looking at the diagrams on the on the on the screen um did i get all of those patricia did i miss part of the question yes nope you, you covered everything and so tabenda azam would like to know how much time should be dedicated to discussion in a 75 minute lecture <laughs> oh um i think i think we all have our own answers to that um and it's always a challenge isn't it because you know, with with my group and and probably many of our groups, um, they are very driven. We we don't we haven't lost that incentive to deliver as many factoids as much information in as short a time as we can. And I am a horrible victim of that 
temptation. Um, I, I, I as probably as you can tell from this, I, I like to talk and, and I'm reluctant to step off the stage, uh, but the students really need that. So in 70, I don't know. I mean, and it also depends on the topic. I mean, if the more the students can explore and learn for themselves, the better they're going to know. So you want to give them the tools and then let them go. You know, if my, I, I teach in 50 minute bites and generally in lecture, I will stop maybe twice and I'll give them two or three or four minutes for that group discussion, group work, answer these easy questions or answer these thought questions um, where, where um, I circulate around the room. So you know, five or 10 minutes out of 50 would be what? 15 minutes out of 75, but that's just me. I mean, and, it's, and some days it's gonna be zero. Some days you may wanna devote most of your lecture. So you really have to adapt. But you know, my, my rule of thumb is they start to zone out after 15 or 20 minutes. And I can not only give them a break from listening to me, but I can give them something active, functional, engaging for them to do. Um, so, so that's kind of my rule of thumb is go 15, 20 minutes when, when it fits the material and give them two, four, three, four, five minutes to process and use that information. Great, thank you. Donald Shaw has another question and he's talking about in the first three chapters, you covered the introduction, the chemical level of organization, and then cells and tissues. And he's wondering what are the first three lab topics that you have covered in sequence? Yeah, and that's that's a part where I, that's a place where I depart a little bit from my own advice. It's, it's really hard to get the two up and running together. Um, so for lab, um, I generally go right to, well, our students have had a general biology class before anatomy and phys, but we spend very little microscope time in there. So I give them a lab on using the microscope and on histology is the first two. And then we go to muscle. And that mostly coincides with the way we're going in lab, uh, the way we structured in lab too. Okay. And we do have an anonymous attendee who asks and states, it has been 40 minutes and you have covered teaching and learning principles and what faculties many of us do or do not have. And that may be facilities. Um, can you please get to what system can deliver and how to integrate the system into physi physiology classes for those of us who do not have wet labs. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah, there are some typos here. So I'm trying to uh, make sure I understand. So whoever typed this, can you retype and uh, send the question back in a way that we can understand and I'll come back to it. Thanks. So I'm let's sorry. go to Okay, let's go to George Steer. What exactly does the system measure? Um, the system, you're referring to the physiograph, I, I assume? Um, let's assume that George Steer, if you want to uh, confirm that, please do. Okay, so the, the if, if we're talking about the physiograph, that's, that's the one that's modular and you can choose what you like. And so for us, we, um, we did, we did dedicate a lab period to just learning the system and they had uh, a, pulse, uh, a pulse transducer uh, and a, a clicker to, to do some very simple um, uh, data collection uh, just so they learn where the buttons are and such. And then um, we used uh, an ECG system. So we collected electrocardiograph um, first, the first semester, the first course, we do mostly muscle. That's where the bulk of our lab work is. So we did electromyography there. So we measured, measured electrical activity of muscles. Um, second semester, we did the simulation uh, for endocrinology. We did, uh, that's where, the, where we did the ECG in the second semester. And this, the system that we used, uh, the AD instruments, LT sensors, uh, give you a couple of ways to do respiratory. Um, we, we, uh, one, the one we used was just wrapping a belt around the abdomen where it measures, uh, pressure there. So they measure respiration by movement of the abdomen, um, or the chest too, perhaps. Um, you, you have an option to buy a transducer box if you want to actually do, um, breath and, you know, um, 
volume analysis of respiration, tidal volumes and such. Uh, but you know, my my philosophy was didn't want that darn box. Um, I preferred the modular um, sensors. So that was that that was a sensor for the pressure for the belt. Um, and I think that's that's what we use. We had like five sensors measure five different things, including the clicking instrument to you know measure reflexes and those kinds of things. Yeah, great. Helena wants to know, do you experience any resistance from your students or colleagues? Um, well, uh, when we went to the physiograph system, there was an extended discussion um, with my dean of faculty and my vice president of academic administration for that upfront um, expenditure. Um, but we, they, they understood the value and they understood our students that many of them are um, looking for health careers and that would be valuable for them. Um, so, I mean, I guess that's the one thing because it, it, that portion, that upfront cost was, was a little bit more than, you know, some of our faculty have been uh, allowed to spend on a routine basis. Um, but most of them is, you know, well, yeah, it's physiology. Um, the students have been, I, I think my, my approach worked pretty well with the students most of the time. You're always going to have outliers, but they really are convinced by, you're going to have to take that exam, and this is going to help you pass that exam to get to be a fill-in-the-blank nurse. Um, uh, we also have, you know, a, a student population here that's pretty, they're pretty courteous uh, you know, compared to some, some institutions I've been in. Um, if there's pushback, it's not been directly to me. It's been grumbling in the hallway, but I haven't heard it much. So yeah, we've been pretty fortunate with that regard. But um, I guess that would be the main thing is, is the upfront instrumentation cost when we brought the physio lab, physiology labs in. But as far as curriculum planning, um, I've been, as I said, I've been fortunate with colleagues uh, when I have had help with the anatomy of fist sequence. Um, they've all been very much on the side of how can we do a better job and, and we've worked together well. So uh, part of that is just circumstance. I've just been lucky, but it's something you can cultivate too if you have resistant faculty. Gradual and persistence um, often, often is uh, the way to go. Okay, and we have uh, one more or two more questions and uh, George Steer wants to know, he says, tidal volume and such does that it is possible for a forced vital capacity, which would require a mouthpiece and flow meter? Yeah, yeah, that, that's the one that we chose not to go with because it did require extra equipment besides, you know, the, just the, the sensor itself. Uh, the mouthpieces, when I've done it in the past, um, we just use disposable um, paper tubes for that. Um, so, so it is possible and 80, instruments can can accommodate that so can other companies so it, it is possible but it was our choice to go with a uh, a simpler or not as precise uh, means of measurement which we thought would make the point at the introductory level and met our needs so it, it was you know measuring our facilities and our budget and, and making a decision and that was our choice Okay, we have two more questions and then we'll close it up. And George also says, thank you for your presentation and answers. You have a lot of thank yous and comments in the chat portion too, and we'll share that with you. Let's go back to the anonymous attendee and, and let me go to the second part of the question, which I, I think has to do with the physiograph system. Can you please get to what the, the physiograph system can deliver and how to integrate the system into physiology classes for those of us who do not have wet labs? Okay, well, I mean, you don't need much by way of what, really what you need for this is just desk, desktop space and a laptop. Um, so you have a laptop with an internet connection, whether it's Wi-Fi or whatever, um, and the students log in, they have their own accounts through the company. Um, they log in and they choose the lesson that's up to date and they simply plug in their sensors and each sensor measures a different thing. And, and um, I may have mentioned that we used um, uh, a, pulse, uh, a pulse transducer for the fingertip pulse, pulse um, an ECG apparatus, which you also use for uh, not just electrocardiographs, but electromyographs we used for both. It was essentially the same equipment. It's just putting on different parts of the body. Um, and we had simply um, a belt. Uh, attached to a wire that would plug in that we used for that 
uh, measuring the um, abdominal um, abdominal circumference when we did the respiration, and that was that was six labs, and then five or six labs, and then we also had they also will deliver simulations where all you need is a laptop, and they will provide you with here's how it would have been set up, here's the kind of data you would have collected, and do some analysis, uh, and they also will do the analysis for you. Say you know make this. Um, do this tra uh, mathematical transformation and just click a button and it will do that for you also. I, I hope that's what you're looking for, George. Okay, and we have one more question, which is a three-part question, and we're at 12.02. We will finalize uh, the webinar soon, so thank you for those of, of you who will continue to stay with us. Um, Adel Adele Fatah Noir wants to know, do you make your PowerPoint presentations up for your lectures available to students before coming to class? That's a, that's a great question, and I discuss it all the time with my colleagues because we all have different feelings about it. My view is, um, well, I, I harvest a lot from the from the internet as far as illustrations go. I'm not real happy with the particular textbook I use with their illustrations, so I harvest a lot, and I am really unsure about copyright. So um, I believe I have right to use them, um, you know, as as educational. Um, Education, but I, I'm certain I'm not at all certain I have a right to let students be printing them out. So my my approach is kind of halfway. What I will do is I will um, put my PowerPoints into outline, um, save it as outline, and, or RTF, save it save it as RTF, and then I will go back and reformat them to so all it shows is the bullet points. I will. Add in the links for the you are for the illustrations I use so they can go look them up themselves. So we're not violating any copyright, just telling them, here's the slide, here's what we talked about. Click on the link to see the illustration we used. And then when I reformat them, I separate each bullet point so that they can take notes right in there. So I encourage the students to print out, I call them the slide transcripts, print out the slide transcripts, bring them to class. And as we lecture, to take notes right on there. So they're not writing the bullet points down, they're writing down the elaboration. And I tell them, you know, if they just study the slide transcripts, they might get a C. You know, if they want their A, they're gonna have to be taking notes and paying attention to what those 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 bullet points mean. Absolutely. And I guess because of copyright, you do not record your lectures as well. Is that correct? No. Okay. Uh, final part for this question is, did you use peer instruction in lecture or team-based learning in lab? Um, not formal team-based learning. Uh, I mean, they all work, have them work in groups always. Um, so, but I don't formalize it and give them training in that. And that's probably, that's really a good idea. I should, I should follow <laughs> up on that. Um, uh, peer instruction is something um, we have been advocating for as a department for some time. And it looks like it's going to happen. Um, the, the administration has agreed to allow us to bring students in uh, to um, sit in on classes and to be available for tutoring and for helping with that group work that we do uh, at time to time. So uh, we recognize its value. Uh, we have for some time, and it looks like we're actually going to make some progress on that point. Um, okay. So that's another place where I'm anxious to learn more about and, and to implement. Great. I said that would be the final one, but we have Sushri. Uh, he's really excited about your uh, presentation, but he, he wants to know, would you encourage students to just study the PowerPoints or also read the textbook as well? Okay. Well, encouraging and actually getting response is entirely different. Um, the, the advice I give, which the high performers will follow and not everybody else will, um, I tell them at minimum, please at least skim the, the, the text reading in, in anticipation and look at the, the illustrations they do have, then take lecture notes and then go back. And if they can't at least read, if they can't read in depth to at least go back to those parts of the text that they felt um, didn't, that I didn't do as good a job explaining as, as they needed. Um, so that's kind of the minimal. I would really love them to read before and after, but as a realist, I recognize that only happens in rare instances, but you know, the minimum is, is skim it, lecture notes and study those lecture notes. And if they're serious about that, they can do pretty well on my exams with just that. Okay, great. Well, that's going to conclude our Q&A session. And we do have maybe one or three uh, questions, uh, Dr. Urban, that we will submit to you. But we're also going to provide your information in the chat. So if you want to send 
uh, more questions to Dr. Irvin directly. Uh, Jacob has put that information in the chat. Uh, email is Lurven, L-U-R-V-E-N at marionuniversity.edu. And the website they can go to is www.marionuniversity.edu. So we are about out of time. And Dr. Irvin, thank you for your presentation. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you yes. also, Patricia and Jacob and Margaret behind the scenes. And thank you, uh, American Physiological Society and AD Instruments. I, I was very grateful. Well, you just said everything that I was going to say. And I just want to add that we want to thank our wonderful attendees for your time and for joining us today. Thank you so much.